we think about all those different things in which God has done for each and every one of us, let's just remember that he's still the sweetest thing that we've ever even seen, tasted, or experienced in our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would, please turn with me back to your Bibles, the book of James. As we look in the book of James, we're going to go back to uh, the last verse we did last last week because there's just so much good, good, good stuff there. As uh, one farmer would say, it gets gooder and gooder. But as we, we look here, we find James saying in James 1, verse 8, Let's go to verse 7, then go to verse 8. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you, Father, I just ask that you would be with us here tonight. Father, let us see your word for what it is. Father, let your word be, simply put, just applied to our lives here tonight. Let us see who we are. Let us see where we are. And Father, let us look to you for the answer. In your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen and amen. You know, as we look here, we'll, we'll find this one, this pandemic of something that is uh, throughout most churches and a lot of Christians. And I want to uh, quote uh Chris Well, I'm going to quote uh, Billy Graham in this one statement, and then we're going to jump off from there. And they, they both have said this at different points in their ministries back before I was born, so don't, don't throw anything at me. Go find them and you talk to them. Uh, and that is that over half the church is probably lost. Now, I think we can really see that now as, as we look on the other side of this, uh, this pandemic that we've went through. I was talking to a... a uh, dear preacher friend of mine, he would he would be what would be considered uh, my family's uh, pastor. He was my great grandfather's pastor. He was my grandfather's pastor. Uh, he was my dad's pastor. Uh, and so he's one of those kind of guys, right? And I was talking to Brother Jimmy today, and he just uh, called me out of the blue and was talking about how uh, since COVID, half the people at his church never have came back since the first round of. 14 days to stop the spread. And, you know, as you look at that, and you look at, uh, you could start to ask the question why, and there have been plenty of uh, pastors that have asked this question. Uh, there have been plenty of pastors that have resigned their, their positions at their church because of this question, why did this happen? And, and to be honest, it, as long as the pastor is being faithful to the Word of God and teaching the Word of God and doing the things in which He's supposed to do, uh, the numbers are not really His problem. They're a God thing. But what we find too many times is the very fact that the pandemic that really runs throughout uh, many churches as well as all throughout the world is this thing called double-mindedness. So as we look there, we find uh, Him saying there, uh, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Uh, he is double-minded uh, man, unstable in all his ways. So I want to look at this for a little while. What does it really mean to be double-minded? What, what does it mean? What does it look like? And as we look at that, we, we, we can find a few things. We can find, uh, number one thing, what's the cause? Well, why, does, why do people act and are double-minded. Why does this happen? And honestly, it's because that they've been brainwashed with a non-Christian worldview. Too many people, churches uh, and people outside of the church, too many people want to have their own worldview. The worldview that they, that they grew up with, the worldview uh, that they're comfortable with, the worldview of thus saith me. 
And because of that, we find that we become very much double-minded because there's really only one way in which we can be. And that one way is, what does the Word of God say? And does my life uh, match up to what God has called me to do? But unfortunately, too many times, it's, what is the world going to think? Now, I've heard for the last two years that uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, Nashville, as well as out in Anaheim this year, that, that they would continually would say these words, the world is watching. The world is watching. We need to be unified because the world is watching. We don't need to be unified because the world is watching. We must be, what does God say? Because God is watching. And if we are worried about what the world has to say, then we have a worldly view. We're being pragmatic instead of what God has to say and have a godly view and being faithful to Him. Because when we have the worldly view, then we are double-minded. You see, th this double-mindedness and this brainwashing of the, the world view, it, it's really a deception of Satan. It's a deception from Satan himself. If you'll remember, going back, Genesis 3, I know we, we, we continually go back to Genesis 3. Why? Because that's where all of this began. We find in Genesis uh, 1, God created man, uh, male and female, male and female, he created them, uh, he them. Uh, we know in uh, chapter 2, he explains what he did, how he took and he breathed life into man, and man became a living soul. And then he gave man a help me because he knew man could do it on his own. Amen, brothers. Then we get to ver or chapter 3. And in chapter 3, we find that what does Satan do? Satan comes in and he does his little bitty playbook that he's used since the very beginning of time. And he distorts the word of God and he makes uh, man question the word of God. And then he gives a false premise and therefore deceiving us to give us a, a double-mindedness, a different worldview. And when that happens, sin gets in. And when sin gets in, death surely reigns. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of death reigning in this world. We find that this, this brainwashing, it really, truly plagues our society today. In the news today, now I know we're in this place called Georgia, right? How many of you guys are, are, are familiar with the state of Georgia? If you are familiar with the state of Georgia, then you know of, of what is up in uh, the northeastern uh, section of Georgia, something called the Georgia uh, Guidestone. What they are, they are uh, uh, the stones uh, that have uh, these different things on them. It's sort of a, a globalism type of manifesto. Here are the things that the globalists want to happen. And it's a different worldview. And it's plaguing our society today. The first two on that those lists is eugenics. That word, what does that mean? Well, that, that is what you find that happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. It's what you find that happened by Margaret Singer uh, starting in uh, the early portions of the 20th century that is in America alone has killed 65 million people. Population control and he, they, they continue on it uh, they show how uh, everybody is supposed to be a global community and when you have an alt with another person we don't have war we we go to court how does that how does that sound right we, we go to court. Uh, and all these other things that are on there, we could go into that, and I could spend hours on it. We're not going to. But what is it doing? It's showing where the worldview is and how that worldview is being brainwashed to make people be double-minded even when they don't realize it. Then you remember... When we talk about this double-mindedness, we, we need to remember what Paul said. 
Paul said this. He said, I know what I should do, but I find myself not doing it every single day. Why? Why does that happen? Because we become double-minded. We know what we should do, but then we don't do. Because we're scared, we're afraid, or it's inconvenient. double-mindedness whether that's in the church body the church individual or the world itself you know as you look at this uh, uh, Jesus even talked about this and Jesus talked about this uh, there in uh, I believe it was in Matthew chapter 24 and in Matthew chapter 24 there are the the Pharisees and they're there they're they're showing how great and righteous they are, how religious they are, and all Jesus says is you're a bunch of hypocrites. Because there's hypocrisy in wearing a mask. There's double-mindedness in wearing a mask. And when we wear a mask, we're portraying to the world one thing, but what we truly are is totally different. Jesus would say it this way, too. I believe it's in Luke. And in Luke, he would say uh, that the Pharisees, the religious bunch, uh, that they were a nice-looking couple on the outside, but on the inside was vile damnation. Because they were double-minded. Then you look at... Uh, you look at your Bible, and you sl- just look at a few of those, right? Uh, you look at Adam and Eve. They, they were double-minded because they listened to the serpent. And, and, guys, we can't get out of it because it says, after she ate, she gave to Adam who was with her. He was just as much at fault. Sorry. But we find it that, that in the Bible they were double-minded. They knew what God had said. They knew what God had done. They knew where God had been. They knew that, that God was going to be back there again. And but yet, what do they do? They go against His Word. Every time we go against the Word of God, we are being double-minded. Then you can look at Abraham as he goes into Egypt, and he, he's scared because uh, his 80-year-old wife looks really good. And she looks so good that that he's afraid somebody's going to kill him over her. So what happens from there? He says, don't tell him I'm your husband. Tell him I'm your brother. Now, did he lie? That's a trick question. Yes and no. He was her half-brother. So technically, it wasn't a lie, but it was a lie because he was living a double-mindedness. He was living in fear. Then you look at Adam and Hagar. Let me help God out. You realize every time we try to help God out, we are living a double-minded life. David, Bathsheba. We keep coming back to that one here lately. And and we look at David, Bathsheba, David, this this godly king, uh, this one that was a man after God's own heart that commits this... uh, uh, this, uh, Sin after sin after sin. Why? Because he was living a double life at that point in time. And it cost him. Sin has generational victims. His own son would die as a baby. Another one of his sons would die because he was trying to kill his own father. Another one of his sons would die because he tried to overthrow the king. Generational actions because of his double-mindedness. Then you look at Jonah. Jonah, he, he, he's a prophet of God, and uh, as he's a prophet of God, what's he going to do? He's, he preaches the word, we, Sabbath in, Sabbath out, Sabbath in, Sabbath out. He preaches at his synagogue, and and he's a good preacher, and God says, you're, uh, you're the man I want to go over here and, and to get these people saved. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm running away. Double-mindedness. 
Of course, we know the story. He gets ate by the whale. And well, uh, three days later, spits him out on the sea right there where he wanted him to go. And then uh, as he's there, he preaches what God has told him, and there's a great revival. And we all think that's the end of the story, but it's not. Then you go to chapter 4, and what you find in chapter 4 is he's double-minded again. He's just preached salvation to these people. They've repented. They're, they're beginning saved. And then he's, he's still like, well, they still need to die. Double-mindedness. You look at Gomer, Hosea. That's not a showing of double-mindedness. I don't know what is. She knew where she was supposed to be. She knew what she was supposed to be. But yet she chose something different. You realize every time that you know where you're supposed to be and you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, you're being double-minded. For those who know to do good, do it they not, to them it is sin. How about Peter. Peter, this one that took out a sword and cut off an ear, and then saw God himself pick that ear up and put it back on a man. But yet he still said, I don't know him. Peter, again, with, at Galatians, in the Galatian church, he's, he's living out, uh, he, he's doing... Uh, the, the gospel, he's preaching the gospel, he's there in Galatia with his buddy Paul, and as he's there with his buddy Paul, he's living just like the rest of them, showing them that it's okay, and then all of a sudden the Judaizers come in, and what happens from there? That he changes just like that. He was living a double-mindedness. So you see, it doesn't just happen to the world. It doesn't just happen to, uh, to those that are faking it. Sometimes it happens to the best of us. I want to go over real quick. I want to read you a few things out of Philippians. Right, just uh, real quickly as we look at uh, Philippians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 27 just for a minute. And it says there, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That alone ought to convict. So that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear your, uh, of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. With one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He didn't say double-minded, did he? He said one mind. What's that one mind supposed to be? It's one mind, uh, uh, desire, he said one mind, uh, there we are, and it's a, of the gospel of Christ. Not of what do you think you should do. Not of what did Memal do. Not of what would Papal say. But what does God have to say? And we are to be in unity of one mind when it comes to this. If you're following along with me, then you can turn over one page. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Now let this man be in you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So, so it's not just one mind, or it's not just... A mind, it's not double-minded, it is to be the mind that was in Christ. What did Christ seek to do? To do the will of the Father. Not the will of you. Not the will of your spouse. Mama or daddy. To do the will of the Father. That's the one mind we are to have. If we have any other thing that, that gets in the way, we are being double-minded. Same page, uh, chapter 3. Uh, there we find verse 15. Therefore let, uh, let us as many as are mature have this mind. See, if we are not going, if we are going to be single-minded about the will of God, that will mature us. We will not stay babes like the Corinthians, or like half of the churches in at least 
the Western culture. And if any, uh, and if in anything you uh, think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to disagree that we have already attained, let uh, to the to the degree that we have already attained. That's very important. Let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. So, so what's he saying there? What's what's Paul saying there? Paul is saying right there to the degree of your understanding, that's what you are to do. But guys, I don't, I don't expect anybody in this room to be able to accurately and wholeheartedly give every aspect of the Trinity. I don't. Why? Because it'll blow your mind. But we believe it. We may not know what the will of God for us is tomorrow, but we do know what it was today, and we are to do that will today. Brethren, join in the following... uh, in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us to uh, us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell even weeping, uh, that there are enemies of the cross of Christ. There are some even within the church buildings tonight, all across the world today. They're in church, but they are enemies of the cross because they live a double-minded life. They live one way now, and then tomorrow they'll live another. Whatever is best for them, that's what they will do. That's being double-minded. Whose end is, here you go, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. That means their ambition. Whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. How do you know whether or not you're double-minded? Well, well, there you go. There's one. What's your ambitions? Do you realize that those ambitions can lead you to destruction, shame, and all things? Who set their mind to earthly things. Then you look, same page, verse 7, chapter 4. Uh, And there he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How are we we to not live in a double-minded life? Well, there's your answer right there, that we live through the peace of God, which goes greater than any understanding else that we could have. How can, you, how can you be happy when this is going on? How can you be happy when that's going on? Because I'm seeking the will of God and living in the peace of God and His understanding. Just as was said a little bit earlier. I have to check every single day for, to make sure Romans 8, 28 is still there. Because there's going to be something that's not going to go my way. Anybody else have that problem? So we got to look at it anyway and see that all things work together for good. All right, so as we, we look at that, then uh, we find that we are living for Him. We are living for Christ, not ourselves. You remember Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, but it's Christ who lives within me. So if we realize that as we die daily, that we live in Christ, then that's going to get rid of some of that double-mindedness that we have. Because we become God-centered, Christ-centered in our beliefs, in our thoughts, and in our actions. There are going to be people that you know. There are probably people right now that you know. That for years you just knew that they were a child of God. They were doing everything that they were supposed to do. You knew that, that, that they, they had it, that, that they just simply had it. But all the time inside, 
their beliefs and their thoughts were masking the truth. Until one day their actions showed who they really were. As we look, we find that, that in this double-mindedness that what happens is, is that our own desires that we try to revive or relieve or feel some emotional, psychological, and spiritual need that we perceive that we can do. The oh, I can do this, God, don't worry, I've got it. Living in double-mindedness. With that you find uh, verse 14 back in James, James 1, uh, verse 14. And as we look there, uh, he goes on to tell us, uh, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. When we seek our own desires and our own wants, we'll be enticed to sin, and sin will lead to death. In doing, our minds and our hearts become divided, and our directions are somewhere else other than towards Christ. We come to think that we are serving God, when really we're serving self. You ever been there? I know what God would have me do right here, and we go do what we think God would have us do before even asking Him if that's what it is we're supposed to do. Sometimes it works out. Many times it is destructive to the family, to the cause of Christ, and to the church. It can be seen in our addiction, this double-mindedness, can be seen in our addictions. That's why you find in uh, not only the world, but in the church a lot of times, that addictions run rampant. Eating disorders. Bad habits. You know how, you know how you used to know that you were in a Baptist church when I was growing up? All the deacons were out front smoking before his church service. It was just a bad habit. Was it that or were they living a double-minded life thinking that they needed this greater than they needed to follow Christ in all his ways? Then you got hero syndromes where, where somebody feels like they got to be the hero to come in and fix every situation. How many times does that fall flat on its face? Or Nightingale Syndrome. Let me tell you right now, Miss Evie, before you're 16, eventually you're going to start dating, and there are going to be some people that you're going to say, some men that you're going to see, and you're going to say, oh, I can fix them. No, you can't. You can't fix them. Only God can. As we look at that, we find that Satan brings this to, for us to see that then we become agitated, we become full of anxiety or panic or even depression. And what it does is the same thing that happened in Genesis 3, that it distorts our view of God. It distorts our view of what God's will is in our lives. So, so, so now the so what? So what do we do when we become double-minded? All that was in introduction. We'll try to get finished. So what do we do when we become uh, double-minded? First, you must or you have to be diligent in all your decisions. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us all about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, all of you should know it. If you don't, uh, read it when you get home. Uh, you find there, uh, starting with verse 3, uh, there he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So what does that mean? That means that our war is with more 
than just the flesh. Philippians says that we battle against principalities. You look at that in the Greek, what does that mean? That means demons and oppressions. That's what we battle against. Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God by pulling down strongholds. So who is it that pulls down the strongholds? Who is it uh, that can get us from being double-minded? Who is it that can take care of this situation? It's God and God alone. And he, and he may not do it all at one time. There's that progressive sanctification. That goes back to what, you, what we read earlier in Philippians, to the degree of our understanding at that point. When God gets us to a point and he shows us what we're to do and we do it, then we're going to continue on and continue to be sanctified. It's not like we're perfect right then and there, but yet we're continuing to walk down this road that God has called us to so that we will not be double-minded. Verse 5, casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity and obedience of Christ. So, so that what do you find there? Casting down the imaginations. That if you look at the word imaginations, you're going to find it means our reasoning. What do we think is good? What does the Bible say right there? Casting that down. Get rid of what we think is good. That imagination is not only just reasoning, but it's also in the sin. And so casting down the sin that's in our life. And some people, you ready for this one? Because as we, as we continue to, to look at the, the dichotomy between uh, James and the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you're going to find another one that's right here when we look at this, in this double-mindedness that Jesus said there at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said these words, Before you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye, get the log out of your own. But what do we do? I can handle this, Jesus. I got to get this little thing out of his eye. Sometimes those vain imaginations are in our judgmentalism. It's easier to see somebody else's sin than it is to see our own. But we, we lead captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, so as you look at that, uh, that, that captivity, uh, what does that mean? What, is it, what are we really talking about there? We're talking about we capture those thoughts. We don't let those thoughts rule our lives. We don't let those perceptions rule our life. Too many people have that problem, especially inside of the church. But we, we lead every thought to obedience of Christ. So what does that mean? Obedience means the submission. We must submit every day. We must submit all of our thoughts every day. We must give attention to those thoughts. So in doing that, we must slow down and take every thought. You ever just run off the lip? Don't say yes, because I know you have. So have I. We get all upset, and then we just say whatever comes out of our mouth. We get Peter syndrome. Open mouth, insert foot. But he says, slow down and take every thought captive. Last but not least, how do, so what do we do? Well, what do we do is we maintain our focus on the reality and the truth that is only found in Jesus Christ. See, he alone saves. You've never saved anybody. He alone saves. You may have led them, you may have brought them to the water, but it's Christ alone that does the saving. He alone justifies. 
He alone's the one that makes them just as if they've never sinned. And if you find yourself, by just, just real quick grab it, if you find yourself living a double-minded life, what do you do? you got to go back to John 1, 9, confess, and he is just and faithful to forgive and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Now, keep going. He alone sanctifies. You can't give somebody a tough lesson. It's got to be God that gives it to them. He alone empowers. What has he empowered you to do? And real quick, theological break, what are you doing with that? Because he that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He alone glorifies. You know, the greatest asset in any person's life some people will say family. Some people will say wealth. Some people will say their legacy. The greatest asset we have in this life is our breath. Whether you talk about the spirit that is within us or the breath that God gave us when we came out of the womb. We must maintain focus on that truth. As we maintain focus on that truth, it is in our choosing to live godly lives day in and day out. You messed up today. Okay. Ask God for forgiveness, and you still got the rest of the day, and you got the rest of your life. That's the reason Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's a daily activity and this comes as we maintain our focus on the reality and the truth that is only found in Christ it's through the faith and the grace of God what is your faith in right now what is your faith in is your faith in the fact that this right here is solid? Or is your faith in knowing that God contains all these atoms together? Is your faith in what you see? Or is your faith in what you've experienced in Jesus Christ? Because it's by grace. By the very grace of God that we are able to get out of the double-mindedness that has plagued us for years and generations. It's the very grace of God that, that he shows us through that progressive sanctification. It's through that grace of God that we truly see that salvation. So if you find yourself being double-minded, what, what do you do? You slow down. You look to Him. And you live through Christ. Through Christ alone. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you now. Father, I don't know any of the true hearts and souls and minds of the people. Maybe they are dealing with double-mindedness. And Father, inside their lives are truly one of anxiety, that of fear. And Father, they just right now, they need you. Father, as our eyes are closed, I ask that you would to pierce that heart. Father, as you pierce that heart, Father, find them on your altar. Your 
for your throne, giving you their prayers, that they would give it to you and grab onto the horns of the altar and receive the grace and the mercy to no longer live a double-minded life, Let them see you in unison and live the rest of their days through you. Totally through you. For your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. All right. We've got, let's see here, Sunday morning.